Uh, today we're talking about remembering. And, you know, we all have a tendency to forget, don't we? We all have a tendency to forget in our lives. In fact, most of us, including myself, mostly myself, we forget things every single day. You know, we might start out the day intending to remember everything that we've got to do, but it just happens even to the best of us. And uh, most of us, at one point or another, we've forgotten where we parked our car. Have you been there? You walked out from shopping or the grocery store, and you're like, oh, wait a minute, where's my car? And then you got to do the the automatic lock sound as you walk down the aisle to try to hear your car and where it is. Okay, we've been there. Or you forgot your password okay, for to log into a website. That's why I, which is probably not the best thing, I have the same password for every single login on the internet. Okay, probably not the safest or most secure way to do it. Or we forget where we put our keys, you know, and we've got the the, the things that we have now, you know, that if you maybe you have an air tag or some kind of tag on your keys that, you know, where you, if you lose your keys, you can look them up because you've got this air tag. Uh, a few weeks ago, I, I had I have AirPods and and I lost my AirPods. I cannot keep up. For me, it's the AirPods. I don't use them a lot, actually. Uh, but when I do use them, I lose them. <laughs> and uh I lost my AirPods, and I looked it up on my phone, and it said that my AirPods were at this random address in Woodstock, right close to 575. And I thought, okay, well, that's kind of strange. And I was trying to remember where I had been and if someone could have picked them up. And so I had plans to go to this address in Woodstock right off the interstate. The map little showed the, the house backed up to 575. So I, I looked up, I did research. I looked up the person that lives at this random address in Woodstock. I found them on LinkedIn and I send them an email. It's like, hey, I know this is kind of random. Okay, some of you are judging me right now. I see you're looking at me. You're looking at me with judgment. Just, just stay with me here. So I sent them an email. I said, hey, I know I, this is kind of out of the blue but I think that I might have lost my AirPods and it's showing up at your address. And so I had plans to go to, I didn't go to their house. Okay, wisdom stepped in. I didn't go to their house, but I had plans of maybe going to their house, knocking on the door, be like, hey, I know you don't know me, but I, I think I lost my AirPods. Not accusatory in tone, just simply offering the information to see if they might have my, my AirPods. Well, what happened was the, the AirPods died while I was driving on 575. It must have been passing that neighborhood that was right off the interstate. So the AirPods thought that they were at this person's random house. They were actually in my couch uh -huh. the whole time. So, so if you ever lose your... your your AirPods or your phone and you do the find my phone or whatever, it's not always completely accurate. And I'm so grateful that I didn't show up at this random person's house suggesting that they might have my AirPods. And so uh, that's just a, the, the challenge of remembering. But, you know, it's one thing to, re you know, forget to pay a bill or to let the dog out or to feed the kids. Hopefully you don't forget to feed your kids. But uh, it's even worse, you know, when we forget maybe someone's birthday, an important event, a friend or family member. And I think we're also all prone to forget when it comes to God and our relationship with God. And this is a big one uh, because when we forget who we are and who God is, uh, I believe that that brings greater challenges, much greater challenges than when we forget where we put our keys or, or where we've placed something that, that's important to us. So today I want to talk about remembering. You know, remembering is an act of worship. And all throughout the, 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 the Bible, specifically the Old Testament, God instructs his people to remember. And he's instructing them to remember what he's done because what he's done is delivered them uh, from bondage, from captivity, from slavery in Egypt. And subsequent to that salvation event, God calls their attention back to what he has done. And so worship helps us remember who God is and what he 
has done. Now, forgetting isn't something new. You know, I, we, we have all forgotten. I bet your parents or grandparents forgot your name from time to time, especially in moments of uh, frustration. Um, as long as people have been on earth, for, forgetting something is, is something we've all done. And so, as I mentioned a moment ago, God's people often forgot what God had done. And God spent a lot of time reminding them. And in fact, in the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel, people were constantly sort of drifting away from God. They began to worship other gods, and uh, the gods of their pagan neighbors. They lost sight of their identity. And, and Samuel, who was a prophet and leader in Israel, uh, describes a series of battles that takes place between God's people and the Philistines. And, and in 1 Samuel 7, they're sort of, they're at this moment where they've just been defeated by the Philistines. And in 1 Samuel 7, verse 2, we read this, that it says, Then all the Israelites turned back to the Lord. So Samuel spoke to all the Israelites. He said, Do you really want to return to the Lord with all your hearts? If you do, get rid of your false gods. Get rid of your statues of female gods that are named Ashtoreth. Commit yourselves to the Lord. Serve him only. Then he will save you from the power of the Philistines. You know, I got to admit, maybe you can identify with this. Sometimes I wonder, you know, how could they forget God? And how could they forget all that God had done? I mean, God led them out of captivity into the promised land. Like, how could they forget where they were and what God had done for them? But I don't want us to throw the Israelites under the bus. We're quick to do that. We might think, well, man, how could they forget? That's, I wouldn't forget. But we do the same thing. If we're really honest, we do the same thing when it comes to God. Sometimes we forget who God is and what he's done. Or we lose uh, sight of the fact that when I didn't have a chance in the world, when I was far from God, God loved me. And gave me hope, a purpose, and a future. And we forget that we are like the nation of Israel, that we forget who God is and what he's done, and we begin to, to chase after other things. We begin to search for purpose in something or someone other than God, that God will get us through whatever it is that we're going through. We forget that God loves us more than anyone will ever love us. We forget that God sent his son as a sacrifice for us. We forget that God loves us unconditionally without, you know, conditions on them. That's unconditional, that God forgives us, that God accepts us, that God gives us a community of people called the church to walk with us through anything that life brings. We forget all of these things. And we, we might not turn to physical statues, like the Israelites did, but what we turn to is every bit is real. We worship relationships or success in our careers. We, we turn to the recognition of people. We starve after likes on social media. Or we turn to the security of wealth or possessions. We turn to the rush of pleasure and addiction. And so every day we need to remember and maybe you've never thought of remembering as an act of worship, but it is a daily act of worship to remember who it is that we worship, who it is that we follow, in whose presence we long to be found. These are acts of worship. The tendency to forget is, is not only true about the Israelites, or it's not even only true about us. It was also true about Jesus's first followers. Jesus's closest friends were also so easily distracted. They often failed to remember who Jesus is and why he came. They, they longed to pursue many of the same idols that you and I chase after. His disciples got sidetracked into uh, a priority mix-up, and they began to pursue other things like overthrowing the Romans and that Jesus was you know, that he was going to overthrow the Romans and that they were going to lead this revolution of political nature. And Jesus had to remind them, no, I'm, I'm here to bring about another type of kingdom. 
And then my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is of, of heaven. And so when it comes to Jesus, the first thing I want us to remember is who Jesus is. Now, that might seem simple to you. You might say, well, yeah, of course, we're remembering who Jesus is, that's sort of obvious. But we do tend to forget this when we pursue other things. And one of the ways that we can remember is by grounding ourselves in God's Word, the truth of God's Word, to remind us of who Jesus is. And so I'm going to build this list on the screen, and I want you to remember who Jesus is through this list. In John 6, 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And so I remember that Jesus is what fulfills me, that any other pursuit that is outside of Jesus is not, is not going to satisfy me. In John 8, 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And in this truth, I remember that Jesus brings light, that he is light. And then he's called me to remember that he is light in the midst of darkness. You ever been in a dark moment? <clears throat> Remembering that Jesus is the light of the world in this moment is what helps us to move forward. John 10, 9, Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. That it is through Jesus that we find eternal life. In John 10, 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That I remember that it's in Jesus that I have protection from, from enemies, my, and namely the enemy, Satan, and his desire to corral me, to distract me, to discourage me, to, to lead me to drift away from, from Jesus. In John 14, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That life, I remember that life is ultimately found in him. The very next chapter, John 15, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And in this, I remember that everything in life when it comes to following Jesus, is about staying connected to him, that, that he says of himself that he is the vine and I am the branch, that, that he is the source of all of my growth in this life. In John 11, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they died. Whoever lives by believing in me will never die. In this, I remember that this world and life on this earth is just a passing moment. That it's my temporary residence. And that in Jesus, I, I have resurrection and I have eternal life. That death does not have a hold on me. That death is not God's design. And so we remember who Jesus is. We also remember what Jesus has done. Romans 5, Paul is reminding us that when we were far from God, Jesus sacrificed for us. Romans 5, 6 through 8, Paul says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. See, religion says you got to muster up the power, the knowledge, the strength, do the, all the right things. That's not what Paul says in Romans 5. He says, when you were powerless. You ever felt powerless? Maybe you had a circumstance or a situation in which you were totally not in control of and you felt powerless. Paul says, well, multiply that by a million, that at the moment you were powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Think about the moment that you in your life where you were the furthest away from God that you have ever been. <clears throat> and think about that. And that's the moment that Jesus died for you. That, that, that version of you. 
is the version that Jesus died for. See, most of the time we're embarrassed to, to even share the, the messy parts of our life, but it's the messiest part of our life that Jesus died for. He doesn't run away from those parts. He runs towards us. He embraces us in his grace and mercy. Verse 7, Paul says, Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If you're going to memorize any scripture in the New Testament, this would be one I would suggest. Romans 5.8. Romans 5.8. Write it down. Take a picture of it. This is a scripture I would suggest you memorize. Because when we are prone to forget, it's scriptures like Romans 5.8 that sort of bring us back to God's heart. They realign us with God's heart, that God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I mean, just think about that. Again, we live in this culture that says love is as an emotion, but love is a conscious decision. There are... There is some emotion involved. I want to, don't want to totally discount emotion when it comes to love. But love primarily is a decision. God made a decision to display his love by sending Jesus. Demonstrate it for us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, oftentimes we think, well, we've got to clean up our life before we come to faith or, you know, we show up in church or... You know, all those things or get baptized. We think, well, I got some things in my life, you know, that I, I just got to clean up. And I'm like, no, no, no. I think you've misunderstood the, the whole message. That if the message is, I've got to clean up my life before coming to Christ, that I think you've been sold of the wrong message. But through culture or even through the church, we... We have been conditioned at times to think that we've got to clean ourselves up before we come to faith or we come to Christ or come to be baptized. But that's not what Paul says. Paul says, no, no, no. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's what Jesus has done. And so we remember what he's done. The last thing is we remember who we are. And I put this last because the first two... Who Jesus is and what Jesus has done really forms who we are. You see that? It it forms who we are. And so when when we remember who we are, it's based on who Jesus is and what he has done for us. And these are some good reminders to remember. Truth from Scripture. John 1, 12. You are a child of God. You are a child of God. John 15, you are a friend of, sin, a, a friend of Jesus. Jesus is a friend of sinners. You're a friend of Jesus. J- Romans 6, you're no longer a slave to sin. Romans 15, you are accepted by Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, you're a new creation in Christ. Ephesians 1, 4, you're chosen holy and blameless before God. 1 John 4, 10, and and he tells us that you are loved. I I want us just to sit in the truth of, of these scriptures here for just a moment. That you are loved, that you are holy and blameless before God, that you're a new creation, that you're accepted by Christ, that you're no longer a slave to sin, that you're a friend of Jesus, that you're a child of God. See, here's what happens when we forget the truth of Scripture. We begin to believe the lies of the enemy. I, I don't think there's an in-between here. I don't think there's a gray area. When we, when we drift away from, from believing the truth of Scripture and who God says we are, then the only logical place to drift towards is, is the lies of the enemy. The lies of the enemy are the exact opposite of that. The lies of the enemy get us to believe that uh, you're, 
God, how could God possibly accept you? After all you've done, you think God accepts you? The lies of the enemy says, oh, sin, you know, like, it's not sin. It's not really sin. It's just you deserve this, right? You, you've worked hard. I mean, it, it's not sin. I mean, they're just, they're just sort of uptight. You need to, to have a little fun. The lies of the enemy said, say that Jesus, he couldn't possibly accept you with your track record. You're a follower of Jesus. I mean, after all you've done, the lies of the enemy say that God hasn't chosen you. He must, have, he must have chosen someone else. I mean, look how messed up you are. There's no way God would choose you holy and blameless. Does God know your rap sheet? See, these, these are the lies of the enemy. There is no gray area. When we drift away from the truth and promises of God, we drift toward the lies of the enemy. And maybe you've been a, a Christ follower for a long time. It's never, it's never a bad thing to remember who Jesus is and who God says that you are. That's why I say that what Jesus says about me is greater than what others say about me. And what Jesus says about you is greater than what others say about you. I don't know what kind of week you've had where maybe others have said some things about you that Jesus, Jesus quite honestly might be ashamed of. But I want you to know that Jesus says you are his friend. Jesus says you are God's child. Jesus says you are one of mine. You're accepted. You're fully accepted. Apart from anything you can say or do, that you're fully accepted. You're a new creation in Christ. You are not identified by what you have done. You're identified by what Jesus has done. And maybe you've been in church or a Christian for a long time and you've never heard that. I don't want to assume that anyone has really heard that, but I want you to hear it today. That God does not love you any more based on your best day or any less based on, on your worst day. What Jesus says about you is not only greater than what others say, it's more important. What Jesus says about you matters way more than what someone else says about you. I want to finish with this. A.W. Tozer, one of my favorite quotes, he says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. That's why I want, my prayer is that what comes into your mind when you think about God is that you are his, that you belong to him, that you are accepted, that he makes you blameless through Jesus and that you are loved. And that is the most important thing about you. Not, not, not your status or career or your network of relationships. Those are things that God gives us as gifts, sure, blessings, sure, but they are not the most important thing about us. The most important thing about us is what God says. And he says that we are his children. And I think maybe some of us needed that reminder today. We needed that reminder from his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would, that the truth of your word would dwell in our hearts, Lord. That your word would not just end passing through our ears, but the truth of it would settle into our hearts or the center of who we are and that we might be changed as a result. Lord, maybe some of us in the room today needed, we all needed a reminder, quite honestly, of who we are. As we gather together today hey. to worship, to sing, to pray, to hear your word, God, may we be built up and encouraged by the truth of your word to go back out into this world in which you've called us to live as a faithful witness to Jesus in the places that we live or work 
but the people we hang out with, Lord. We're, we ask that you would strengthen us to be faithful witnesses in those places and among those people. And God, maybe today remembering who you are and what you've done that forms the foundation of who we are, maybe, maybe that's what we needed today to remember. And we just ask this in Jesus' name to help us remember. In Jesus' name, amen.